All right, can you hear me? Turn me down just a little. All right, I do apologize about that microphone. You could tell that it was trying to be on, but the connection was wrong. I do apologize about that, but still a great song. And uh, makes me think of the best of Goodman and the Goodmans who used to sing that song. And, uh, praise the Lord for that. So, John chapter 7. <clears throat> Verse 45, John 7, verse 45. The Bible says, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never a man spake like this man. Then answered them, The Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? And they answered us unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search, and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, just thank you for this time, Lord. I pray that you be with us in this time, Lord, that our hearts would be turned toward you. And God, that you would just help me to step aside, Lord, and that it could be a message from you, Lord, that would encourage our hearts and meet the needs that each of us have. Uh, Lord, personally, as we draw closer to you, Lord, and may that be our goal, Lord, to lift you up and draw closer to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to be probably a simpler and a shorter message tonight. Uh, just uh, got a lot of thoughts rolling in my head and try to come down on a couple of them and without uh, being too uh, general and getting them all out, just limit them to a few of them so that we got something uh, that, that God can use in our hearts. There's, there's a message, I've preached this before, and other situations. Uh, at the beginning of this year, beginning of last year, I went out to Goebbels with Dr. Doug Yoder, Brother Doug Yoder, uh, Bethany's father, and I preached this message there. And uh, it's just a message that I enjoy preaching, I enjoy considering in my own life. Uh, talking about never a man spake like this man. And we have a Savior who is not like any other Savior. We have a God who's not like any other God. We have a religion that in reality is not like any other religion. For when other religions are devout and they're strict and they strictly adhere to the, the rules, uh, that's all that there is to it. It's, it's just a devout person. Usually a lot of piety, usually a lot of pride that would go into that. But when we have the Lord Jesus Christ and we follow him with discipline there's a lot of power and love that is supposed to be in our lives that will come when we are following him and again it's not legalism like I said this morning but we ought to be a lot more inclined to read the Bible a lot more uh, of, a, of a nature of our natural desire to be with God's people to read his Bible to witness to other people to call on to him and uh, to be obedient to the things that we know to do. It ought not be something we've got to muster up the desire. If we're walking with him, those things are just natural to us. And as we do, the world sees a difference between us and the other religions. And there's so many other religions out there. You know, if I, I feel that if we, in the workplace, if we allow people to talk about Jesus Christ, you know, there's going to be those that say, well, you've got a lot of me to talk about Allah and you've got to allow me to uh, talk about all these other religions and all these other gods and I think as a boss in strictly a secular sense you either got to limit it or say yes but in the reality no oh, no there is no other God but the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, that holding your job are probably not going to coincide but it'd be worth giving up your job for the Lord Jesus Christ you be a, you be an employee that's worth your salt more than worth your uh, wage, 
someone that does their job well, and I think they'll consider, maybe they'll still fire you, but they'll consider, wait, we're going to lose something here if we fire him for his testimony for Jesus Christ. But if they do, I think for me, it would just stir me up all the more <laughs> to say, all right, now what have I got to lose? So uh, I hope that would be our case, that we just consider there really is nothing to lose. If we've died with Christ, as the Bible says, I'm crucified with him. The reality is whatever we think we've got to lose, we're supposed to have been crucified with him. And therefore, what do we have to lose? If we stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ, there is nothing. And so, never man spake like this man. There is no God like our God. And we serve him and we love him. And who can sing amazing grace about Allah? Who can sing amazing grace about Buddha? And who can sing how great thou art about all these other gods? And have the truth and the love and the power of their God come through those messages. There is no one else but the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that their God stirs them to, out of love, give their life up for him. There are religions that, out of fear, you'll give up your life. Or out of duty, you'll give up your life. There's a lot. There's some religions that do that. You go and kill yourself for your religion and, and you've pleased your God and, and you, get, you get these things and you've also... It was, your, it was your responsibility to do. But when it comes to doing it out of love, who else has that but the Lord Jesus Christ? <clears throat> and love is a greater force than responsibility if we do out of love. My mother and I were friends now. I've said that probably for a lot of years. It's not just she's my mom, she's a friend. We've got a relationship that goes beyond her being my mother. We talk about things and we think alike and Obviously, she raised me. You know, there's going to be certain things that are alike, but uh, me just being out on my own, and, and we come, I've come to conclusions that she's come to as an adult, that certain things in life, and we've got similar opinions and things like that, but uh, it's not just she's my mom and I have to obey her now. There's a deeper relationship, and, and I do love my mother, even though I tease about her age. I said... Uh, I've said this before, not from the pulpit, but I've got a million ways of teasing my mom that she's old. That averages out to be one per decade she's been alive. She told me not to say it. Oh, yeah. She says if I keep saying that, the things that she's doing at our house to help our house, when she's visiting, she'll stop doing. <laughs> so I said, please don't stop doing our dishes. and Please don't stop dusting. No. Um, but I realized <clears throat> I'm at the age now that she was when we started teasing her for being old. So I don't know what that means. It's different with me. I'm not old. She was then, but I'm not now. But <laughs> we have a relationship with our God, and we love him. And that love and that power, since he's the real God, I like to, John chapter um, 7 Verse 45 through 53 is where we're at. John chapter 7, 45. And uh, chapter 7. Um, I like to tell people that when I'm witnessing to them, I said, I'm going to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. But because I know he's real, I don't have to sit there and beg you to consider him. I'll let him, who's the real God, move in your life. If he's just like any other God, then you're going to forget this and it's all over. But if he's the real God, which he is, I just need to tell you about him and let him work in your heart. And so we have a God that is different from other gods. But this story here in John chapter 7, <clears throat> verse, uh, well, before 45, they had sent the officers to go get him because they didn't like what he was saying. And they came and they listened and my first point is, they came to hear Jesus, and we've come to this church service tonight, but why did they come? Why have you come? They came with not a pure purpose. They came to catch him at his words and take him and punish him for his words. And that is not the reason that we would come to church. Yes, ma'am. John chapter 7. 45 is where I started. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, why have you come? Some come to cause trouble. 
And again, I have nobody in mind or I'm not pointing out fingers or anything like that. Some come to be trouble. No, when you're teaching Sunday school and, and when I first uh, started developing this message back in Bible college, I was teaching a Sunday school and it does appear. I heard someone say this and I think it had a lot of truth to it. Some people, the devil wants to keep you tired and sleepy in the morning so you don't get to church. Some people, the devil wakes you up, helps you get your clothes on, helps you get out there on time so you can come to church and be a distraction. And so <laughs> some people come to be a distraction. Some people come doubting. Some people come for other reasons. Some people come for religious reasons. They feel like this is something they've got to do in order to earn salvation is come to church. You, you go out there witnessing, you hear about people's testimony, it won't be very long before you hear, well, I go to church, <clears throat> or I used to go to church, or I grew up in church. <clears throat> we had an encounter with someone who called himself an apostle. When I was visiting Malawi, we went from Malawi to Mozambique. I always get it wrong. It was Zimbabwe, and in there... In Zimbabwe, we encountered someone who called himself an apostle, and we asked him for a salvation testimony. He said, well, I grew up in church. My father was an apostle, and one day, God called me to be an apostle. Any, anything missing in that salvation testimony? Like salvation? <laughs> it, just, it, it amazed me. We know that many people have that, but for someone who's a leader in the church that he was, how could you just totally not even recognize that that is not even close to a salvation testimony? What's your salvation testimony? I grew up in church and God called me to preach. Did you ever meet Jesus? Did you ever repent? Did you ever see your need for the blood of Jesus Christ to cover your sin? Did you ever see that you needed his sacrifice in your place? Did you ever see that you were on your way to hell for your sins, which you deserved? Did you ever see any, none of that? And no, oh, yeah, 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 if you, if you lead them. But they didn't come up with it on their own. There's something missing there. And so some people come for religious reasons. Some come for righteous reasons to worship, to learn, to come in fellowship with uh, the brethren. I've known churches that were social meetings. They come because Brother Jesse's there, and I'm going to talk to him about the game, see what he thought of that game. Did you see that last-minute touchdown? And we're going to have a good time talking about that. But did we come to worship God? Did we come to hear from his word? Which, by the way, if we're going to live the life that we know we're supposed to live for God, it has got to be us being in his word, drawing strength from his word. I, I think of it like uh, 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 just it's, it's a point in the week where we really do. It's like a, a power-up button or something where we, we, we live it for the Lord and the world's out there bombarding us with, with ungodliness. But... Wednesday comes along and we should be able to, we should desire to come to church and get strengthened back up a little bit for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday to go out and live in this world that's telling us this is crazy to do, telling us this is, this is the wrong life to live. We need to come and, and, and be around other people, get into his word, worship our God as, as a body, and those ought to be the reasons that we come. <clears throat> Some come for recreational reasons. Annabelle already told me she enjoys what I preach so she can sleep during the message. And uh, I will be short, sweet, and coherent <laughs> tonight. So some come for religious reasons, righteous reasons, recreational reasons. Why have you come? These people came not for a good reason, but at least they were there. So the second point is while you're here or while they were there, they got to listen to the words of Christ. And we'll take just from this chapter at first, and then we'll consider some of the other things that Jesus Christ has said. But you look at John chapter 7, verse 7. So it's talking about never man spake like this. Get the context right to some of the things that they were specifically talking about that they heard that caused them to say that. You look at 7. The world cannot hate you. But me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. So he's telling those that the world will hate for his sake. They will hate you, but it's not you they hate. It's me that they hate, because I reveal 
their evil, their wickedness, their ungodliness. The truth of Jesus Christ shows that they are wicked, that they're living in ungodliness, that they are not pleasing him, that they are not right with God, and they do not like that. So never a man spake like this man. This is one of the things that he said in context to cause them to say that, that I'm here to reveal your wickedness. That my word, that my words and, and the Bible and my presence, and we know that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came to convict men of sin. That God came to show men their wickedness, that they need him. And if you have spiritual pride, you don't want to hear that. No, I'm fine. I'm, I'm good. I got it. When I, I think of this sarcastically, I'm, I'm not... Uh, immune to pride myself but I don't think that I'm a, pr I'm a proud person I try to just do my best and I got a pretty good understanding that there's not really much that I have to offer apart from Jesus Christ I don't just say that I really believe that any gifts I've got or any good that I can do is because of his grace but when I see people that just walk around and they're beating their chest and they're saying I am all that it just I feel so sarcastic like boy you're the first one in all the history of the world to ever think you were all that. You really got the market cornered on being the best there is. When the next guy thinks he's the best there is, or the guy down there thinks he's the best there is, everybody thinks that they are all that there is. And no one realizes that's pretty pathetic to have so much pride that you would think that you have no faults, no needs. And some of them, you listen to them or you be around them and you're like, boy, there's a lot of problems there. There's a lot of shortcomings there, and you think that you have no faults. And so pride is unbecoming for those who are afflicted by it when other people are just so proud that they, they, they make you feel like you are nothing compared to them. And I just think sarcastically, boy, you just, <laughs> you're not the only one in history who thought that, who really wasn't. And so spiritual pride, think that they don't have need for anything. They don't need Jesus Christ. That's one of the reasons they say they don't believe in him, which I believe the Bible says they do believe in him, that the Spirit uh, works with their conscience to show them, to move in their hearts, that Jesus Christ is the way, that he is God. And, and there's a part of them that knows it's true, but then that pride comes along and says, no, that's not true, you don't need that. And it keeps them from truly being saved or knowing that they need to be saved and then what chance do they have if they don't think they need it and so why have you come many different reasons while you're here listen to some things that some of the things that the Lord Jesus says and one of them was they're going to hate you but it's not you they hate and that's for our sake the world is going to hate us and that's I believe that hate is about to start becoming more and more evident but it's not us that they hate it's him and what that needs to do and I believe it's going to do it in my heart I already see it in my life when, when I know they don't hate me they hate Jesus I know that I can't save them Jesus can whatever you do to me is irrelevant what you need is Jesus so do what you need to do to me I want to show them Jesus he's the only one that can make a difference anyways if I was the way of salvation and they threatened to kill me, then, oh, man, i got to defend myself. But it's not me at all. I have nothing to do with it. So don't worry about defending ourselves. Don't worry about standing up and saying, I've got the rights that, that, that you're, defeat, you're uh, overstepping my rights. Don't worry about all that. Whatever they're going to do to us, understand that doesn't matter. We need to be lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ, saying he's the way, the truth, and the life. You come at me that you're going to kill me, you're going to throw me in prison, that's irrelevant. I need to preach Jesus Christ because it's not about me anyways. And so that frees me from that responsibility. I don't got to worry about saving them. I preach the gospel. Now Jesus has got to do something to save them, which I believe that he will. He will work in their lives, but their pride very often will stop them. That makes me think of this story. I was reading, reading a book Danny lent me about a man persecuted for Christ. And uh, they were feeding him crusty bread and water at 6 p.m. every day, and that was the only meal that he got for 24 hours. 
6 p.m., that's what he got. And that water was called soup, but it was nothing more than water. And then they would make him stand at attention that whole 24-hour period, looking at a white wall eight, hour, eight inches from his face so that the white would hurt his eyes. And any time that they blinked, they'd punch him just as hard as they could in the face. Make him fall, he'd stand back up, make his eyes stay open. The next time he blinked, they'd beat him again. And his heart started saying, obviously you're going to have some hatred for that guy. You're going to have some ill will toward that man doing that to you. You've got a lot of battles within yourself just to stay away, just to stand up. There's a lot going on. You're enduring that pain. But his heart started saying, I feel sorry for that man. Because that man hates God this much. How sorrowful is that man's fate that he hates God this badly? I've got the promise of heaven, but this man hates God and is on his way to hell. When all that other stuff was stripped away and it was just the truth of a man and his God and what salvation is and a man who hates God, now his heart started breaking for that man because there was nothing else in his life to think about other than the reality of what salvation is. God wasn't delivering him out of that torture, but the hope of salvation was still what was there that got him through it. That hope that God was going to get him through. And that caused him to endure what was going through, what he was going through, and also to feel for the man doing that to him. What other religion would cause you to feel for the man that's beating you? That's love. And that's a man having all the fleshly desires and pleasures and strength stripped away. And it was just him and his God and the love of God showing through his life. That's the kind of love that could save a man like that. If he sees you forgiving him, how can the hardest heart not be moved by that kind of love to say, I forgive you for doing that to me? Corey Ten Boom had an example of that. She met one of the German soldiers that was there in the uh, concentration camps that beat her. And when she met her, all the hatred flared up, but she, God helped her. She knew she needed to forgive him. And she, I believe she shook his hand. And I don't know, I don't remember. I've read the book twice, The Hiding Place, but uh, I believe that man got saved. How could you not encounter the love of God poured out that dis displayed that strongly in someone's life and even the hardest heart has to be moved by that and so if we look at these things that's who Jesus Christ is that he's gonna the world's gonna hate us but they don't hate us they hate him but when God's love can still show through us there's power in that and then we look at uh, chapter 7 verse 16 Jesus answered them and said my doctrine is not mine but his that sent me and so a man, and, and, and later on in the chapter, he further, excuse me, he further uh, discusses that if a man comes saying, look at me, look at me, then you can say that this is a dishonorable man. But Jesus Christ, who was God, came pointing not to himself, but saying, I am the way to God. He was still lifting up God's doctrine, God's truths. He didn't come searching his own when it came to time to go to the cross he didn't say oh I don't have to do this no he gave up his own rights and died for us and lived for us lived teaching us truth so he didn't come declaring his own rights he came declaring God and when a man does that you can't say that man is lying if I was saying it's all about me then you have right to say that's a crazy person he's lying it's not all about him it is about Jesus Christ but he was lifting up God he was pointing others to him, which made his testimony believable, honorable, except for those whose pride caused them to not want to hear. So verse 16, now verse 28, chapter 7, verse 28. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me and know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true. Whom ye know not, but I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him. So that was one of the things that he said that no man was ever saying, 
that caused them to want to take him. He's saying, I am from God, which was making himself equal with God. And he still was pointing men to God, but he was saying, I'm the way to God. And they didn't like that because they thought they were all right on their own. I can get to God on my own. I don't need this guy saying that he's the way. And that sounds disrespectful to say, but that's how they're feeling. I don't need some other person helping me. I have it figured out. And how shallow is that, that you think that a man would think that he doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anybody. Anybody with any wisdom knows they don't know that much. <laughs> that they are unable to, to uh, save themselves. They need the Lord Jesus Christ. So within the chapter, those are some of the things that they were hearing him say. They said, never a man spake like this man. We'll look at a couple other verses outside of the context here. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No other man was saying that and could say that. And that was some of the things that people were hearing from him that said, never a man spake like this man. And one of the things that Jesus did, and this actually came later, after this occurrence with them not being able to take him because they couldn't take him in his words. But we go to chapter 8, verse 44, and the Bible says it's a familiar verse. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father will do you will do. He was looking at those prideful men who did not think they needed anything, didn't think they needed a savior. He was looking at them and calling them out and saying, you are of your father the devil. And these, chapter 8, is, is men that, were following Jesus. They had been following him, which we often think that someone who has the look of following Jesus is saved just because of that. But these are men who were following Jesus, but once he looked at some of those men following him and said, ye are of your father the devil. So there's a distinction between looking like you're following Jesus and having Jesus as your savior. Not everyone that comes to church, not everyone that says they know Christ, knows Christ. These are men who were following him because of the miracles, because they wanted, uh, they wanted to see the bread, uh, the, the fish and the loaves be multiplied. They wanted to see that kind of stuff, but they weren't following him because of who he was. And there's not some great hidden truth that we need to know that they didn't know. They just didn't know the gospel, that they needed a savior. They thought they were fine and they wanted to see a miracle. And I heard a leader, a Christian leader, he was very wrong. He said, a miracle always settles the issue. That's a very bad doctrine. A miracle doesn't always settle the issue. And in, John, in Luke chapter 16, though I, though Lazarus and one rose from the dead, they will not believe. If they do not believe the word, if they don't believe Moses and the law, they will not believe the one rose from the dead. A miracle, the Bible's saying a miracle doesn't always settle the issue. A miracle doesn't mean that you will have faith. Having faith in the gospel that you are a sinner who needs a savior, that is saving faith. That's what settles the issue. And so, ye are of the, your father the devil, and lest of your fathers you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh of a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. He was calling out wickedness, boldly saying things like that to men that thought they were following him for the right reasons. He was calling them for what they were. And as preachers, as teachers, as, as Christians at all, we need to be unafraid and bold to say, if you're not saved, you are of your father the devil. And, it, and I've heard this said, you will... You will see that unsaved people will act like unsaved people. And when someone has any other testimony but the blood of Jesus Christ, repenting, turning to him, trusting him, when it's any other testimony, you can expect they're going to act like their father, the devil. It's going to come out eventually. The lies, not so much the murder, maybe the murder, but the deception, the truth is not in them. And so he was calling out people who thought they were walking in the right way but were not and saying they were of their father the devil. Could you imagine <laughs> calling people out boldly that, that everybody else thought they were saved but you can see that they are not saved and boldly saying you are of your father the devil. That's going to cause problems in today's world, in today's churches 
that would cause an uproar that you would be bold, so bold as to call someone unsaved, unsaved. And I'm, I don't want to get too far in the wrong direction, but not everybody is saved. And sin needs to be preached against. And people who have no desire to turn their back on their sin and just continually live in their sin need to question their salvation. And I don't need to. But I believe it would be a pastor's place to do so. And I'm not so much talking about our pastor specifically, but it's right for people to say, if you do not have any uh, conviction about your own sin in your life, you cannot continue to say that you are saved. The Spirit of God dwells in that person if they're saved. And the Spirit of God will lead them to all truth. If there's no desire to turn your back on sin, yes, we will fall, but you, you hate that you fell. Yeah, you will you come short, but you hate that you came short. Man, I'm sorry that I did that. I hate that that sin is in my life. But if you act like it's nothing, you need to be told that that does not mean that that does not look like you are saved. <laughs> that way, that person has a chance to be saved. If they think that they're fine, but they have lack and they don't think they lack anything and no one ever tells them they lack, they'll never look for it. But you, if, they, if, they aren't, uh, if they are not saved and you tell them, I don't believe you're saved, maybe God can start working on their heart. Wait, maybe I'm not. Maybe I do need to make this right. And so these are some of the things that Jesus was doing that was causing them to say, never a man spake like this man. By the way, some of these things, these are what we can do. We can proclaim that like I already did, like the world's going to hate us, but it's not us, it's Jesus. We can proclaim Jesus Christ. We can point men not to ourselves, but to him. We can stand up and say that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. We can stand up and say, if you are living like the devil, <laughs> you're probably your father. So why have you come while you are here? Listen to some of the things that the Lord Jesus Christ says, and then what will you do with what you have heard? These people went away, unable to accomplish what they set out to do, which was take him, but they went away confused, and then the men that sent him said, wait a minute, are you deceived as well? You didn't do that which you set out to do. Well, we couldn't, sir. The, the, he, didn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't saying anything that we could catch him in his words. He was wise beyond what we could have understood him to be. But what will you do with what you have heard? Maybe some of those men went away and reflected on the words that Jesus had said. And maybe some of them knew that he is who he says he is. And he is the Messiah. Maybe some of those men went away with that conviction. Maybe some of them hardened their hearts. Maybe some of them said, it doesn't matter. I don't even give another thought to that. I'm going to continue to look for a way to trap him in his words. What will you do with what you have heard? I think of the man who came running to Jesus, and he said, what must I do to be saved? And he said, do this and this and this within the law. And he said, I've done that my whole life. He said, one thing thou lackest, go and sell all thou hast. And he went away grieved. That's not a work salvation. What he did, he said, Lord, and he said, good master. In that passage, and it's in Mark. He said, good master. And Jesus said, why callest thou me good? There's none good but God. And then the next time he addressed him, he said, master. Jesus said, why call me good? There's none good but God. He said, okay, you're just master. He did not believe that Jesus was God. I believe you can take those two and, and you can pull out the fact that that man wanted salvation, but he didn't truly believe in who Jesus Christ was. When Jesus said, sell all you have, well, He's not God, so I don't need to do what he's telling me to do. That's not part of my salvation. Following Jesus, doing what Jesus said to do is not part of my salvation. And he went away grieved because he did not believe who Jesus Christ was. And he was unwilling to listen to him. And so we know who he is. He is God. He is the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He is the only way to heaven. And we've trusted him. And how great of a, of a life that is to know that we're trusting the way to heaven. That come what may in this world, we are going to have the hope of heaven in our lives. The hope of forever being with our God. Forever being in heaven with him. 
forever having him as our light. But there are men who hear the gospel and walk away unmoved. They hear the gospel and they walk away hardened. They hear there are men who are saved who hear get right with God and walk away without getting right with God. There are men who are told if you're saved, you need to be more faithful to soul winning. You need to be more faithful to attending church. There's, there's five things that um, I've always been taught. There's Bible reading, prayer, church attendance, tithing, soul winning that are going to help you have a, a healthy Christian life. And we hear that we need to do more of those things, and sometimes our heart says, no, I don't. <laughs> sometimes we hear the message, we hear the truth, and we don't do what we should do. What should we do with what we've heard? We need to apply it. If the Bible message was, I need to be more in the, Bible, the Word of God, which, by the way, I still struggle with, but I have a heart's desire that I want to be more in the Word. That scripture conference hasn't left me. <laughs> that thing that uh, Brother Veach came and taught is still ringing in my head. Not as loud as it used to, but I still remember a lot of the things that he said, and I'm still challenged by that. This is the sole source of strength that we have in this world. This in God's spirit, which God's spirit uses this in our life. We're going through the trials and the temptations. We're going through the persecution for our faith. We're being told we can't proclaim the name of Jesus, we're, that we can't proclaim what's right and wrong. This Bible is going to be our strength. Prayer is going to be our lifeline. And how can we keep our mouths closed when the world needs to hear about Jesus Christ? Our heart's going to be moved to speak about Jesus Christ. Our heart's going to be moved to come into the house and be with his people. There's coming a day when our relationship that we have together is going to change in the way that it needs to be. The world's going to be against those who proclaim Christ. We're going to be all that we have. The other believers are going to be all that we have. And our relationship needs to be now something like that. We need to be loving each other now. But there's a day coming when you're going to be the only ones you can turn to. They're going to take our houses and our lands and our monies for naming the name of Jesus Christ. We're going to need each other. We're going to need each other's help. We're going to need each other's encouragement, strength. And, and, and a body of believers to help us help each other. You think about, and I think I said this a little while ago, you think about what, what the world is getting set up for. The 2020, we've been hearing this for a while, that certain uh, government locations, like you go into government buildings, are going to require a certain uh, sticker on your ID. And it's, and it's, I don't think of itself necessarily. It's this great big deal. Like it's a, it's, it means persecution for the church. But what I think it means is, is it's more restriction on what you're allowed to do. And, they, and, and it's just an example that they're going to be able to say, you can't go here if we don't think you should. You can't do this if we don't think you should. You can't buy this if we don't think you should. They're, they're flexing a little bit of muscle toward that direction saying, we could control where you go and what you do and what you spend money on. And you think about this. If you name the name of Christ, and I'm not trying to be um, prophetic or anything like that, but if this happens, you name the name of Christ and they take your bank accounts away, how long before your gas, your car runs out of gas? How long before your cell phone dies because the battery died, you don't got electricity at your house? It's not going to take very long in this world for us to become a lot of the stuff that we're so used to just being gone. Just that one little move of taking your bank account away, electronic, it's all electronic. They say, we're not going to let you, your passwords no longer matter. We're not going to let you get into it. They could easily do that. What stops them? Your password no longer works because we don't like what you preach. And they block your money off. It's not going to take very long for our lives to change completely. You guys follow what I mean? I'm not saying that's happening tomorrow, but what stops them from doing that? They don't like us. They hate the cause that we stand for. And so we need to apply the word of God to our life and know he is life. Our money isn't. He is life. Imagine having a job or preaching the gospel, getting to church. All these things without a cell phone, without a car, 
without electricity in your home. Just a couple of the things that could easily be snatched away from us. We'll have no, no choice but to rely strictly and only on the Lord Jesus Christ. So apply it. We approve it. We show the world that Jesus Christ, when we put him into our lives, makes a difference. My boss, Keenan, <clears throat> the situation changed with him. But one thing he's always told me when he was a young kid, he had to steal to eat. Because his mother was always at work. He was out on the streets. He'd gotten himself into that kind of a life where he was, he wanted to steal for the sake of stealing, but he'd steal a little sub every, couple, every once in a while from this one gas station. And he would tell me he knew that the cashier was kind of turning his face, knowing what was going on, just kind of overlooking it, because he knew that's why he was stealing, because he needed it. He said the reason he trusts Jesus Christ is because God said not to steal, but to trust him. And when he got old enough to understand it, he said, I don't want to steal anymore. And he said, I want to trust you, Lord. And God provided a way for him to not have to steal. In the situation I met him in, he was running a restaurant. Food everywhere. He counts food. He's got food on the brain. He's got food in his hands. He's sending food. He's got food everywhere. That's his life. He said, God really answered his prayer. I don't want to have to steal anymore. So God said, okay, here's all the food you'll ever need. And he always told me because he put God's word into practice and it proved true. We need to apply the word of God. We need to prove it and say this is what happens when someone puts God's word into their life and account for it. Let people see the fruit. Let people see what it is to put somebody, put Jesus Christ, his word first. Why have you come? For whatever reason. We've heard the gospel. We've heard some of the things that Jesus has said. Now what are we going to do with it? Apply it, approve it, account for it, put it into our lives that the world may see those who stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ and put his words into action. They can see the power and, and the glory of God in our lives. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, just thank you for this time we have together. Lord, I pray that you help each one of us to consider these things, that your Holy Spirit would do a work in our lives, Lord. All our best intentions, Lord, we need your spirit to make a difference. And God, work in our hearts, and may we respond to your spirit, Lord. And God, we do pray that you be with this time, that we would make the right decisions, Lord, that we need to in our lives, whether it be come forward or where we're sitting. Uh, Lord, that we would do business with you. And Lord, give us power out in this world to stand up for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to page 153 I wandered far away from God now I'm coming home the past of sin too long I've tried Lord I'm coming home coming home coming home never more to roam open wide thine arms of love now i'm coming home fifth verse my only hope my only plea now i'm coming home that Jesus died and died for me. Lord, I'm coming home. Coming home, coming home. Never more to roam. Oh, 
open wide thine arms of love now i'm coming home i need his cleansing blood i know now i'm coming home oh wash me whiter than the snow lord i'm coming home coming home coming home never more to roam open wide thine arms of love now i'm coming home amen thank you sir um thank you all for coming out tonight and pray that god give us a good trip home and bring us back on wednesday and uh i believe pastor should be back on wednesday if i'm wrong about that brother odell the plan is he'll be back on wednesday Yes, and uh, we're grateful he got a chance to kind of take a vacation, recoup a little bit. I know he works very hard. I think he just took some time. There were two days added because I think of a funeral or something like that. There were two days added that weren't expected, but uh, I think he needed the time to just recoup, relax. Uh, Like was said this morning, he only does it every two years as far as taking that much time. So I think that that's all right. He'll come back hopefully rejuvenated a little bit and uh, we'll be we'll be ready to cheer from him and, and begin this year going in the direction that God has given for him to us to go so brother Odell if you would close us in prayer <laughs>